right, guys. Thanks for coming down to the Arizona Bitcoin Meetup. We got a, a special guest for you, um, some new faces here. Um, we'll skip introductions after the talk. We'll they'll, they'll be kind of talk Q and A if you want, or talk about yourself. Everybody can do their own introductions and whatever. But uh, we've got Bert Wagner here. Uh, he's one of the first early individuals who was targeted by uh, the uh, quite lovely law enforcement. Uh, he'll all let he, he'll tell you story the stories of which agencies. Uh, as a lot of you know, there's been a few folks out of Arizona that have been wrapped up in some of these unfortunate circumstances. So I'm interested to hear his story as well. So I'm going to go ahead and let him come up and uh, and talk and hear what he has to say. We appreciate you coming, Bert. Howdy. Um, I'm Bert Wagner. I'm an electrical engineer. I have my own electrical engineering consulting firm, and I uh, design hard disk drives and now solid state drives for a living. And uh, in about 2011, my nephew, Clifford, introduced me to this concept of bitcoins, and uh, I got fascinated by it, and so I learned as much as I could. I went on uh, bitcointalk.org, and I never had any concerns about privacy or my name or anything like that. So my username on BitcoinTalk.org is uh, Bert W, which is my name. And um, so I started learning about Bitcoins, trading them. Uh, I was not a heavy day trader or anything like this, just a little bit here and there. And I had a bunch of Bitcoins over at Mount Gox. And I started to get concerned about Mount Gox, so I moved all my Bitcoins off of Mount Gox and I was looking around for uh, other places to trade and so I thought the safest possible way to trade Bitcoins would be to meet somebody in a coffee shop and trade Bitcoins for cash because uh, that gets rid of the problems with the irreversibility of Bitcoins and so on. So I started doing that and also I used it as an evangelical tool to a lot of the people I met that was their first introduction to Bitcoins. They would buy a couple hundred dollars worth of Bitcoin from me, and I would, uh, and when I was in the mood to sell, I would post on local Bitcoins I was selling, or if I was in the mood to buy, I would post that I was buying. And it was just part of, part of my trading strategy, and it was actually a, a relatively insignificant part of my trading strategy um, financially. And so in 2014. Uh, I had a client, uh, my, my company had a client, Hitachi, and I was working at Hitachi on their latest shingled magnetic recording disk drive, and they had really poor cell phone service inside the building, so I walked outside, I was on my cell phone, I was talking to, I can't remember who I was talking to, and I was surrounded by a bunch of agents with guns, and uh, they took my cell phone from me, and they arrested me, and cuffed me, and threw me in the back of their SUV. And I asked them, you know, uh, what, why were they arresting me? And they said, uh, we do not have to tell you. <laughs> and so, I, okay, whatever. And they were kind of a little bit chatty. They were saying, you know, uh, well, we're going to go break down the door of your house unless you give us the key. And so I thought, well, okay. So I gave them the key to my house so they wouldn't break down the door. And they went off. And they were questioning me. And they handed me a piece of paper. And they said, here, sign this. And uh, my wife is an attorney. And she has trained me never to sign anything without an attorney. And so I kind of looked it over. And it was basically giving up all my Miranda rights. and. Uh, and I didn't want to sign it anyway, so I said, no, I'm not going to sign that. So they said, well, then we're not going to talk to you anymore. So, so they weren't telling me anything oh, anyway, so <laughs> I uh, didn't lose much there. They took me to my house and uh, pulled up into the driveway. And there was, and I counted them because there were so many, there was 22 cars at my house. And the neighbors later said they counted about 30 to 35 agents uh, searching my house. And they searched my house and searched my house and searched my house. They went through every single book. They went through every everything. They crawled in the attic. They crawled under the under the house in the crawl space. And they did not find what they were looking for, which 
turned out from discovery they thought I was some kind of uh, red pirate robber, and I would have millions of dollars and tons of cocaine and all this stuff, which they didn't find because it wasn't there. And uh, they even started cutting into the walls and taking the sheetrock off the walls and looking inside the walls. And uh, eventually they gave up after hours and hours of searching. And over the phone, they called the judge and got a search warrant for my business. And they went into my business, took all the electronics from my whole office, all the computers. They seized every electronic device from my house, all our cameras, uh, every uh, you know flash drive, um, every computer. Um, and then they seized some funny things, like they seized my wife's Sudoku book, which they thought was some kind of secret code book. <laughs> and they also, my, my daughter was 10 years old at that time, and she was into dragons, and there was this, this dragon ruin book, and she had made up her own little secret code with dragon runes. They seized that. And uh, later I found out they had taken it out of evidence 13 times to analyze it. And it was just my daughter's thing. So um, they drove me to uh, Denver County Jail, one week, and I went into the intake center that entered the waiting room at Denver County Jail and waited and waited and waited. And uh, finally I got, you know, after about six hours, I, I just went over there and I said, what's the deal? You know, what's going on here? And they said, uh, we can't put you into Denver County Jail because there's not a charge. The only thing on my paperwork was DOJ hold. And they showed me this. That's all they had was DOJ hold. And they said, that's not enough to put you in jail. So they called around, they got Homeland Security, and they finally got a charge. But at this point, I still didn't know what I was, what I was arrested for. So I got, I got put in Denver County Jail and uh, spent the night there. The next day they came and got me out of jail and took me to the federal court system. And in federal court, I uh, was in a big box with all the people that had been arrested that day on various charges. Mostly they were uh, parole violations, weapons charges, things like that. Lots of gang members. Um, and that was one of my first lessons in the justice system. So, the judge would turn to the first person in the box and say, um, do you have representation? And of course they'd say, no. they say, are you indigent? And the person would say, yes. And they'd say, okay, go back to jail. We'll get you in the attorney. And so they'd send him back to, you know, and then the next person would go, you know, do you have representation? Yeah. No. Are you indigent? Yes. And so this went on until they got to me, and they, while the night I was in jail, my wife, went and uh, cashed in all of our IRAs. Well, she called around and found an attorney, and the attorney said, okay, it's $50,000 cash for me to take your case. So she went and uh, cashed in our IRAs, and our bank was really good about it. We got our IRA money, and she paid the attorney, and the attorney was there the next day. So he gets to me, and he says, uh, are you represented? I said, yes, and he's like, whoa. What do I do? I don't, I've never heard this before, you know? Uh, uh, okay, uh, and then so my attorney came over and said, uh, so actually I got to go sit by my attorney. And I was sitting at the table with my attorney, and this is 24 hours after I've been arrested. And finally, on the piece of paper, got to see what I was charged with. And it was 18, 1960, uh, operating a money transfer business without a license. And it says on there, uh, you know, maximum penalty, five years in prison, uh, $250,000. And my attorney, you know, we've got to talk a little bit about it. So then the attorney talked to the judge and said, um, I'd like to talk about bail. And the judge turned to the prosecutor and said, what is the state's desire? And she said, uh, we'd like to compel the maximum amount of time, seven days, so that we can finish finding his assets. And the judge said, okay. So all that effort to get an attorney, he didn't even get to speak at my uh, arraignment, I guess it is. So then, they took me to the federal detention center. Which, I always tell people, if you're going to get arrested, get arrested for a federal crime because 
the food in the federal prison is way better than the county system. So I went to the federal prison and I was arrested in a operation called uh, Operation Avalanche. And uh, in Operation Avalanche, they arrested five people for Bitcoin uh, things. I was one of them. And there was three of us that had to go to this federal detention center. And at this federal detention center, there was three big jails. They had three separate jails. Uh, jail A, Jail B, and uh, the SHU. S-H-U, it stands for Special Housing Unit, which is their uh, solitary confinement. And the prosecutor had asked for administrative separation of all the people so we couldn't talk to each other, so they had to put us in different jails. And uh, I got the short stick, or the long stick, depending on how you look at it. And uh, I was put in solitary confinement. So I was in solitary confinement for three days and two nights. But I thought I was there for seven days. Because remember, in court, they had said they wanted me there for seven days. And um, so I had my little jail cell there. And if you've ever been to Alcatraz, it was just like that. Uh, it's a little tiny cell with the iron thing. And, you can talk to the people, but you can't see them around you. And uh, so the guys next to me would say, like, what are you in for? And I'd explain it to them, and these uh, criminal, you know, these hardened criminals, they'd say, holy cow, that's just, uh, that's not right, you know? And so, uh, <laughs> so while in jail um, there, uh, that was very educational. They, it's hard to imagine how big the prison system is until you've been inside it. And, you know, the prisoners, I've talked to them, and they, they have their own airplanes. They fly these prisoners around all the time in their own airplane system. That's how big the prison system is. And they talked about getting their final assignment and getting assigned to the final destination, the final prisons. And one of the guys got his final, because uh, we were in just a holding facility. Not in the actual prisons. This is a huge facility where they hold people for trial or for their final uh, prison assignment. So I talked to the guard. The guard would come by about every few hours, and I'd say, "I'd like to call my wife," you know. And uh, they'd say, "Okay, we'll look into it and everything." So on the last day, the third day I was there, I finally got this guy to uh, talk to me. And this one prison guy came in, he said, oh, uh, you're here in solitary confinement, you, you don't get a phone call for seven days. And I, and I was like, but I'm here, I learned the lingo by now. I'm here on administrative separation, I'm not here on a punitive separation. So it's an administrative separation. Oh, it's this, oh, oh, it's an administrative separation. Oh, you can get a phone call, but I'm going home now. <laughs> so, so he left. And I, I never, uh, the whole time I was in there, my wife did not know where I was. My attorney did not know where I was, and uh, I had no way to communicate. Backing up just a little bit, there's this whole scam they have with the telephone systems in the jail. It's all privatized, and uh, when I was in Denver County, my wife had to put down a $250 deposit in order to just call me because of the privatization of the phone systems. But anyway, so I uh, went back and got the uh, bail and got released. I was on to the next phase of the whole thing, which is the negotiation phase. So this attorney that my wife had gotten, a uh, really famous, uh, big uh, Holland and Hart in Denver, Colorado, they're big wigs, and uh, supposedly the best criminal defense attorney. So my attorney talks to me, he says, oh, uh, I'm glad you're with us. Uh, I'm a former prosecutor myself. I, uh, I know all the prosecutors, you know, we, we, we're buddies, and uh, no matter what you've done, I will get you the best deal. So, good, you're good to be with me. You only charge whatever, $200, $250 an hour, but uh, what, is, what is Bitcoin? You have to tell me, you know. So, I spent thousands of dollars explaining Bitcoins to this guy. <laughs> and that was really frustrating. But the whole problem with the justice system I found was. He has to deal with these prosecutors all the time. He cannot piss them off because he needs to cut deals all the time. So his entire existence relies on not being adversarial with the prosecutor. It's the, the more rapport he has with the prosecutors, the better deals he can get for his guilty clients. And the entire system is based on the fact that he's guilty. So, I got really fed up with this, and so my wife went to the Bitcoin Foundation and 
asked for an attorney, and uh, we got referred to Brian Klein, and uh, I hired him. And my experience was that because I had an attorney from California, and I was in Colorado, it, it works. Because he didn't care whether he uh, was adversarial on my behalf. Also, the first guy was like, oh, just, I can get you a good deal, you know, and he assumed that was a good deal. Brian uh, understood the case. He also understands Bitcoin, so I had to explain Bitcoins to him. And he had already done some high critical Bitcoin cases. So, uh, and he worked out good for me. I think I got, I got a, I got a good attorney in that. And so, they offered me a lesser felony which I refused, and then they eventually offered me a lesser felony, and then finally they offered me a federal misdemeanor, which I continued to refuse. And uh, eventually they got in and they discovered that they had no case, really. But they're in so deep at this point that they, they had spent millions of dollars on my case, and they had to get something. So they said, well, we will drop the charges if you will pay us, I, I, I can't remember, I think it was $180,000. So $180,000 and we will drop all the charges. And I told them, how about I give you $4,000 and you drop all the charges? <laughs> and so we negotiated for a long time. And eventually they said, oh, we settled around $80,000. $40,000 in cash and $40,000 in bitcoins. So, my wife and I had a lot of heart to hearts about this because we wanted to take the thing to trial and prove them wrong, you know, and have our day in court and, and everything. And so we talked to Brian, it was going to cost me $75,000. i am already in $250,000 here. It was going to cost me $75,000 to go to trial. And him and the prosecutor both admitted it was a coin flip. It depended on which judge I got, the jury, uh, and the entire case hinged on one single legal question, and that was, was what I was doing on local Bitcoins a business or not? That was the only legal question they were going to really talk about. And if the jury decided it was a business, I'm facing five years in prison. If they decide it wasn't a business, then I'm free. So, this is where you have to realize this whole thing called uh, civil asset forfeiture. And in the civil asset forfeiture system, in the federal system, they charge you with a crime, criminally. But they seize all your stuff, and then they actually file civil lawsuits against your stuff. And the hard, cold hard fact was, I could go through the entire criminal proceedings, be completely acquitted, pay the $75,000, get completely acquitted, jury says you're free to go, and there's a chance that out of sheer uh, maliciousness, they would force me to go through all the civil proceedings to get my stuff back. Often, and most of the times, they'll say, okay, we lost on the criminal, here's your stuff back. But they don't have to, they can actually, and I got the feeling they might do this to me and because they really needed the safe face, they needed to save face and uh, get some money out of the deal. So, so we decided to go ahead and uh, sign the agreement, and the agreement was that they would drop all criminal charges against me, they would drop all civil charges against all the stuff they seized, and uh, <coughs> take the uh, extortion payment of uh, 40,000 bitcoins and 40,000 in cash. So, um, the, out of all this, I learned about civil forfeiture. I learned about uh, the justice system. The uh, Another really interesting thing I learned about was the um, contempt of court laws. And they seized all of my computers, and they were easily, very easily, they got into all my Windows computers and found everything they wanted to know. Uh, they found nothing, but they were able to get in. But my Linux server, they could not get into. They, they had no way to get past the password, and so they asked for the password. And I was... Well, I'm not going to give you a password, right? Here you are, I'm not going to give you my password. But my attorney explained to me that 
If they say, we want the password, and they charge you with contempt of court, you can go to jail forever. There is no recourse. There is no... And they claim that you have the key to get out of jail, all you got to do is give us the password. So legally, they can just keep you forever for a password. So your passwords are only as safe as your ability or willingness to stay in jail. And a lot of people ask me about this, like, oh, I have all my stuff protected and everything, and it's, it's, it's totally uh, immaterial. Unless you're willing to stay in jail for your passwords and for your uh, rights. So that was a contempt of court thing. Uh, civil asset forfeiture, um, they, they actually fund, the Department of Justice and Homeland Security actually fund their operations through this procedure. And um, we kind of started getting, uh, become an active, uh, what do we call it? We started to become very active in the civil asset forfeiture thing. And we were invited, my family was invited to come testify on, in the state system on this a couple times. So I was really proud of my, my daughter, who was 10 years old, got up in front of the State Judiciary Committee and testified against civil asset forfeiture. The whole time she's up there, a 10-year-old girl, there is a row of 12, 14 sheriffs in full gear with all their guns and everything behind her who are there to testify against the bill that she is testifying for. And she did a really good job, and she testified and I was really proud of her. And that first bill went to uh, committee vote and got killed in committee because sheriffs all testified against it. And they said things like, which is very, very telling, uh, well, here in uh, La Hara or La Hunta County or whatever, 70% uh, of our revenue that runs our department comes from civil forfeiture. And if you take that away from us, we will not have the funds to run our sheriff's department anymore. Crime will be rampant, you know, whatever, and they, they give this whole story. And then the next sheriff would come up and say, you know, 57% of our funds come from civil forfeiture, so you can't take this away from us. They go on and on and on, sheriff after sheriff after sheriff, and we got bored because we got to testify first. There was only three of us that testified for the bill. Actually, I didn't get to testify the first time. It was just my wife and my uh, daughter and another person, and then the sheriff started testifying. So we got kind of bored, and uh, so we decided to drive home. So remember, this is a this is at the Colorado State Judiciary Committee meeting. Okay, it has nothing to do with the federal government at all. And I'm on my way home, and my attorney calls me and says, <clears throat> uh, "You guys shouldn't have been there because Michelle Corver called me and told me you were testifying there." This is the federal prosecutor called my attorney to, to chastise me for being at a state judiciary committee. And that was just beyond it for me because that means that those sheriffs, actually, or at least maybe our sheriff, had called her to tell her that I was there. And uh, that was kind of scary. It was like, uh, wow, that's kind of a big deal to told not to testify at a thing, so, and I didn't even testify, it was my wife, so. Um, two years later, we had another bill, and that time I got to testify because my whole agreement was done and everything, so I testified, my wife testified, my daughter testified again, and it got killed in committee, but they went to the House Judiciary Committee, got it passed, got it into there, and the whole law did finally pass, and so, in Colorado now, we have the most stringent reporting requirement law in the country, I believe. And so the sheriffs are all mad about this, but they have to report where they get the money, how much money they get, and where they spend it. And they have to report all that stuff. And uh, the other thing that was really nice is uh, anything under $50,000 has to go through the state system instead of the federal system. So, and the state system is really a much better system because you have rights. Uh, the uh, stuff they have to prove the stuff is guilty. In the federal system, the assumption is that the stuff is guilty and you have to prove it's innocent. But in the Colorado state system, uh, and also in the state system, you have to be convicted of crime before they can take your stuff, which is not true in the federal system. So a lot of good came out of that, and I was really proud of my daughter for taking that. So I, 
give her credit for, for changing that law. So, um, so that's basically it. And um, what I'd like to do is hear if there's any questions, because this can go anywhere. We can go Bitcoin technical stuff, or justice system, or uh, economics, or politics, or whatever. I've talked to Republicans. I've talked to Democrats, I've talked to Libertarians, I've talked to uh, anybody who will listen, and it's kind of interesting. It goes across party lines. The Republicans are interested in this topic of civil forfeiture because it's a you know a property rights issue, right? And the Democrats are interested in it because it's a civil rights issue. You know, the, they, they do this to poor people or whatever. And uh, and that law that I was talking about in Colorado, uh, it was the most Hardcore, staunch Republican got together with this totally liberal uh, Democrat, and they got that law passed because they both agreed that this civil forfeiture thing was bad idea. So that was that was. Um, I don't know. Give me some optimism. Do something about it. Yes. Do you see this as a growing threat from government against? the Bitcoin community as a whole, or is this sort of a, a desperate sort of last grasp kind of thing? You know, I've come to the conclusion it is not Bitcoin specific. They need to fund their operations, and Bitcoins are convenient. As we all know, Bitcoins are very convenient. You can carry a million dollars in your pocket, whereas cash is kind of annoying, right? You get a hundred million dollars in cash, it's heavy, and you have to carry it around and everything. So. I don't think that, I mean, I was personally targeted because I was in Bitcoins, because they were toying with the idea that they could get, you know, they could squeeze a lot of but It seemed like an experiment for them yeah. to see, can we get away with charging people for operating the unlicensed money transmission? Yeah, business? well that, that law is specifically uh, good for them because uh, civil asset forfeiture uh, attaches, uh, it's, it's covered in, it has Patriot Act parts of it that allow them to do things like arrest you and not tell you what they're charging you with. So it's Patriot Act, in case you're a terrorist. Yeah, and the terrorism thing comes into it. So it's a really convenient law, and it's obscure, and they can kind of charge people with it. Uh, but uh, so just that's just be, a tool. So just to be clear, you think this is a crackdown on Bitcoin is more incidental to what the system is and what Bitcoin right. is rather than a conscientious, deliberate plot to take down right. Bitcoin. Or Systematically. Something. Now, uh, Michelle Corver. The prosecutor in my case is a specialist in civil asset forfeiture and a specialist in Bitcoin seizure. Okay, so for her, it's kind of her pet project. Okay, so but system wide, I don't I don't see it as oh we're going to go after Bitcoiners specifically. It's more like she thinks well this is a good way to do it. And uh, but uh, yeah. Um, a question. There's, I know there's a site you can look up to, but uh, basically state by state, the, the, the 1860 the statute, you know, basically relates to yeah. is there a money licensing, money right. transmitting licensing requirement in that state? Correct. Uh, Arizona, for example, has not explicitly said. Texas has explicitly exempted it, saying right. it's not required. Right. Is Col has Colorado explicitly said any? So my understanding of that is that uh, they cannot, although this is interesting, so they cannot prosecute you for 18, 19, 60 in a state that does not have a money transfer license at the state level. But that was my understanding until uh, you were prosecuted and Arizona does not have a money transfer license. Okay, so uh, Texas is an example where they don't because I think Texas has special rules. But, uh, my old understanding until today was that Colorado has a money transmittal, a state money transmittal license, so therefore they could come in and, and apply the federal law. But um, evidently they can apply the federal law whenever they want to. You're saying Arizona doesn't? What's that? Have a money transmitting? I sort of understand what you're talking about. Oh, okay. No, Arizona knows us, but they define yeah. money as something very specific being the sovereign currency of a nation state. Okay, okay, but within our statute, so you're not money transmitting when you're dealing with Bitcoin. Well, I guess that's it. You're only looking at the Bitcoin side of it. You're trading Bitcoin for what they call money USD. So no, no, that's, no, no, I know no, that has no, that's a sale of property. That's a sale of property. property. So, uh, 
that's different information than I just got. So um, the very existence of any money transmittal licensing at all in the state, okay, any at all, the existence of a, of a state level money transmittal license allows them to bring in the federal. And uh, Texas has no state level money transmittal licensing. Okay? So if Arizona has something, anything, they can still yeah. charge you. They can still charge you federally. That was my understanding. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's kind of how I understand. Actually, I can probably speak to that because that aspect of it was in the public motion. Sure. Okay. Um, I mean, it's never been adjudicated, of course, but uh, it is the belief, I believe, of most attorneys who have looked at this that 18 U.S.C. 1960 cannot be applied in Arizona on that problem. Okay. okay. There are multiple problems. Okay. But there is the problem about state licensing. Right. And that that does not apply in the state of Arizona. Okay. Okay. Uh, first off, thank you for being here and sharing uh, your story with us. But uh, just so I understand what what you were doing and what you were charged for, you were instead of trading BTC for USD on Mount Gox at the time, or Coinbase or Gemini right. today, you were using local Bitcoins people in the shops and buying or selling Bitcoin, right? Right. And, and then so they charge you for operating a business without the proper money license. Is that correct. correct? That's correct. Okay, and the money the money transfer license, and I know it may there may be some nuances state to state, but can you just explain what that is and what it's what it's intended to do and right. uh, for traditional business and how you think they may have warped that definition around crypto? Sure, sure. No, uh, I don't think it's been worked around crypto specifically, but it's been worked. And so money transmittal licenses were originally designed for um, Western Union. Western Union, those kind of people that take money, transmit value, and then give the money to somebody, give the value to somebody else. So it's like transmitting value, right? Uh, but they broadened it to cover everything from whatever to bitcoins, right? And even, uh, so we, we talked about, there's three legal questions, money, transmittal, business license, okay? So the money part, okay? So is bitcoin money? Well, my attorney uh, said, it doesn't matter. You can argue until you're blue in the face that bitcoin isn't money. All they have to do is say, for the purposes of this trial, we're going to consider it money, end of subject. Right? Because they have considered it a, 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 a security, they've considered it money, they've considered it property, and, and whenever they charge somebody with something, they can just say, okay, we're not going to deal with this, we're just going to call it money for today. Okay, so we don't know what it is, we're just calling it. So we had no, uh, no viable defense on the money thing. Transmittal. Okay, was I transmitting from one person to another value or something? So that's kind of a little bit more gray area, but there was precedence that that didn't matter. Because under 18, 1960, they had prosecuted other people where it was not obvious they were being a Western Union. You know, they were they were just buying and selling and, and they kind of tied together or whatever. So there so everything in my case boiled down to business. Whether it was a business or not. They claim it was a business, I claimed it wasn't. And that's where we disagreed. And then we agreed to disagree, and I paid them off. <laughs> Can you just share, what, what, if you're willing to, what was the volume of your trades or exchanges? Are we talking, oh, right. you know, 200 bucks at a time or 10 grand and off? Right. So what they do, uh, there's this, uh, technically there's no limit on this uh, reporting requirement, it turns out. So like people think it's $10,000, but that's not true. So if a bank or a financial institution believes that you're doing something illegal with $200, they're required to report, whether it's $10,000 or $200. So uh, they started doing stings and they would buy a few hundred dollars. And then, you know, then they begged me to buy or sell a $1,000, right? And then they got up in the few thousand dollars and I... Uh, said, oh, you know, I'm not comfortable with this doing this in a coffee shop. I want you, and I didn't know they were federal agents at the time, right? But uh, I said, uh, here's what we're going to do. We're going to go to my bank, and you can take your money, your cash, and deposit it right into my bank account, and then I'll give you your Bitcoins, right? And so I thought this was brilliant because I got security, you know, and, and, and they're not going to rip me off, you know? So I wasn't worried about getting arrested. I was worried about getting ripped off. 
And the, the person, the undercover agent that was on that sting, basically said, no, no, uh, you know, we don't want to do that. We, we want to meet in a coffee shop, and we want to meet at this specific coffee shop where they had the video and audio surveillance and everything. And so I, I hemmed and hawed, and I finally said, okay, this one time I'll do it. You know, so I went and did it. So at my, in my uh, discovery, it was in there that I did not adamantly um, force them to do it again. That was used against me. Mm -hmm. But I didn't adamantly enough insist on doing it at the end. So it would be better for people to do that. Yeah. Well, I didn't have no. I had a case at that time. And of course, they were enticing you with percentage points over the market value. Yeah. Well, right? and I, I never. I, mm -hmm. I was. I was never doing this as a business. So I was only uh, covering my fluctuations. You know, I yeah. didn't do it as well, a business. What, I would say, what yeah. time frame? What year was this? Twenty fourteen. I would say that that would be kind of a crucial part of, of their entire case would be. Determining whether you're not doing it as a business, if you're doing it as your say two to three percent points covers volatility right. and maybe a little overhead. Right. You get into ten percent territory, then like, do you have right. a registered LLC that you're operating. Yeah. So yeah, lots yeah, of yeah. things, Those that, kinds of things. That, that make you look like a business. Right. right. I had nothing that I thought. If you're not doing, doing that, yeah. then and you have another <laughs> business. That yeah. is your real business. No, no, I, I had I had all this lined up to go to trial, right? I have my own business. I know what a business is. I have incorporated, I have three different incorporated businesses. I know how to run a business. Yeah. I've run a business for 30 years. I had all that on my side. Uh, this was an insignificant part of my trading strategy, you know, and I did not charge 10, 15 percent. I was just covering all I mostly did it just to introduce people to Bitcoin. You're just trying to right? spread and the word about something. started doing these so bigger many buys. traders out there in, in 2014 was not that early. I can't believe they would go after you with like if you're doing if you're doing a couple percentage points. I know there were so many traders that were that were doing it as a business. It seems right. so strange to me that you got caught up in. Oh that. no! And well, on local Bitcoin. bitcoins, there are people that are advertising themselves mm -hmm. as, a business, yeah. as a business, right? Some of those, uh, some of those you have to know are them. You know, sure. they are, and they and they were wanting my account so bad. They were salivating over me. I had a really high reputation account on local bitcoins. They wanted that account, which they did not get. Uh, but I closed it. I didn't. I just didn't want them to have it with my name on it and everything. So I refused to give them my account. But they wanted it because they could use it to to run their stings from the other side, right? Yeah. So they wanted that. They want the account, the reputation. They wanted the reputation. But the main thing, they thought he was doing drugs. Yeah. That was kind of, they were them there. Think, if they know they weren't going to find it. I think all of these cases have been fishing expeditions. Like yeah. Morpheus. I think they thought they had a big fish on the hook. They tore apart his place. The same story. They came up with nothing and they thought they had. And you pointed out something that I've you know, pretty much suspected from the beginning. The same idea with Morpheus is well, we've gone so far. We've yes. expended so many resources. We can't just let it go. Oh, you we can were see wrong. That. You can see that. In, you can see that in discovery. You know, first day on the job, Eric McWhorter's here talking about bitcoins, learning about bitcoins, whatever. Later on in life, he's like, uh, he called me a genius. I guess he he does. They do this a lot. So I was a criminal genius because after months, they rest. They 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 investigated me for eighteen months. I think it was. So after months, prior to arrest. yeah, prior to arrest. So after months of investigating me, they could not, they had not seen me do one single drug transaction. They had not seen where I was hiding all my drugs. They did not know where I was hiding all my cash, millions of dollars of cash. They did. They, I was so clever, they could not find it. So they went and got a uh, uh, court ordered uh, tracker on my car. So they put a tracker on my car, and. Uh, how many of you know what... Uh, well, at what point was that in the process that you got the tracker? It, it was uh, the 45, about 90 days before they arrested me. Uh, there was a 45 day, they got a 45 day tracker on my car. Um, what's funny, there's a funny part to this. So, uh, I was heavily into ingress at that time. So does anybody know what that is? I was into it too. Yeah. So, here is they're tracking me. You have to imagine they're tracking me. I'm on my way from work home. I go to this. Okay, so Ingress is a game on your phone 
and you go to a place, and there'll be, uh, it's overlaid on reality, so like this place might be a portal, and you come here and you bomb it with, on your phone or whatever, and you go, it's kind of like Pokemon Go, except... It's kind of like geocaching in a way, yeah. except with the interactive gaming element. Yeah, and so I was on the green team, there's a blue team, and you go bomb each other's stuff. But what you do, what you end up doing is, uh, I'll go from work to this random location, and, and I would stay there for a while. And then I'd go drive over here, and I might come back to that same location because I had to go, somebody had put up a portal and I had to bomb it. Oh, yeah, right? you're angry, you are. Uh, you are you're just driving at this random area. Like, you look like you're some. I look like I'm look trying like to lose a tail or some problem. Doing something crazy. Oh, yeah, so it must have driven crazy to follow me. And this was. At the height of my ingress was when they were tracking my car. <laughs> so that was funny. And uh, so they got the tracker on my car, and so now they, they've, they've built me up, and they've, they've, they've gone and got the tracker, and they still haven't found anything, and uh, they had five people under surveillance, me and four other people, and, but I was the most brilliant looking one, so they thought I was the kingpin of this whole thing. And also, at that time, they had just arrested Ross. And they got a lot of money from that arrest. And so I think there's some interdepartmental jealousies here. You know, uh, well, look at those guys. Look how much money they got from their Bitcoin bust. You know, we're, we're, we're going to get the same amount. And so they really pushed and pushed and uh, uh, took the whole thing to a grand jury and got, got the indictments for everybody and promised. I wish I could see the grand jury testimony, but I never got to see it. But um, I always imagine it is a, a wonderful work of fiction. Because they got this grand jury to dive all of this and do this whole arrest and everything. So. Tell them, tell them how they got the judge agreed to let them go in and tear up your house. Well, I think what you're talking about is you know you read the uh, search warrants and the search warrants were these pretty uh, well written fabrications too. But my favorite line in the whole search warrant was um, the U.S. Postal Inspector. I was actually arrested by the Postal Service, I don't know. They were the arresting entities, the Postal Service. But anyway, so the post office guy said, there are no legitimate uses for Bitcoin. Okay, and this was in 2014 when Dell Computers was accepting Bitcoins on their website for computers. You know, just absolute, absolute lie. And uh, but anyway, that was one of the things they told the grand jury, I am sure, even though I never got to see the grand jury testimony. Uh, but they just lie, lie, lie. And they know that 95 whatever percent of all of these arrests never go to trial, so they can say anything they want in a grand jury because it's never going to come to court. Unless you go to trial, which I never did. So. Remember the, the justification, though, you were so smart that they couldn't get you doing anything wrong. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. So the judge Must make them court. feel really smart to call you a genius. <laughs> so we got them. Yeah. I'm curious about the the aspect where they asked for the eighty thousand dollars to settle. Right. So now I know the entire the entire process is is a big just a one big extortion. Extortion. Right. But that particular part of it, I'm unfamiliar with as far as legally. <clears throat> the, like, can you talk about what what fr what framework under the law right. can they just say hey, pay us? Okay, that's really, <laughs> that, is, that is a great question. Well, you have a pretty good idea how much you have. They, well, yeah, they know all that. Right? Well, yeah, well, you know, in testimony, or, or in evidence, it's mind-boggling. So they had every single financial record from every single financial institution for the last seven to ten years, I mean, my wife, everything. They had every single text I ever sent or received, all deleted texts. Every, every text you ever sent, every text you ever received, all in evidence. Of course, it was all crap, yeah. but it was there. Exactly. You know, it's scary that they just say, go to Sprint or whatever and say, give us all the texts. Give me all the texts. Give me all the texts from this guy. Here you go. Here you go. Oh, and, and we kept all the deleted ones, too, by the way. So, mm -hmm. yeah, all, uh, you know, know. so anyway, uh, yeah. that went on and on. And um, so your question was... Is there a name for that? Yes, yes. Okay, process? I'll get that. Okay, so... Uh, That's new to me. Yes. So... Um, Give me all your text process. No, no. So the um, so back back in the old days before prohibition, they didn't have the uh, they didn't have the need to arrest everybody in the country and charge them with stuff. So they didn't have uh, plea bargains. Uh, they used them very rarely. So this whole plea bargain and the passive forfeiture kind of started then. 
So, but, but they got a little more sophisticated because, okay, so let's say you have a uh, company, some big company, and you decided they're polluting the river. And you want to charge this company with polluting the river, but you don't want to destroy all the jobs. So what they'll do is they'll go in, before they indict the people in the company, they'll go in and say, hey, we have all this evidence, we're polluting the river, uh, we want you to cooperate with us, we don't want to destroy your company, we just want to get rid of the bad apples, and we want to keep the company intact, and we want to, uh, you know, find you or whatever, and we want to come to an agreement on this and not prosecute you. Okay? So it's called a non-prosecution agreement. So they'll go into a company or a corporation and say, we won't prosecute you if you cooperate with us and, uh, we won't, and, and we'll save the job, save the company. So non-prosecution agreement, from what I can tell, was used on corporate entities for a while. And in my research, I could not find another individual before me that ever uh, was a party of a non-prosecution agreement. So I believe what they've done is they've taken this tool that they use against corporations for pleading or embezzling or whatever, and pulled it in and said, oh, this is kind of cool, we can do this with individuals. And so, I can't prove that because they're all secret and they're all sealed and everything like that, but uh, I, I think so. So that's what they do, they use a non-prosecution agreement. Now, normally, non-prosecution agreements are done before indictment. But remember, I was already indicted by a grand jury and everything, so I also believe that I may be one of the first non-prosecution agreements that was done after indictment. Well, I just want to point out the, when you talk about the reporting requirement for the 10K and whatever, right, right, right. And you said, well, there's not actually a 10K. There's actually, there is, it's actually, it's because there's two different reports, right? <coughs> right? Well, I don't know anything about that, and I didn't think I needed to, right? He's because not I wasn't running the business. Right. And, well, there's even a higher um, standard for who's required, and, and this came up in Morpheus' trial. It's not simply are you running a business, and this is still, uh, you know, undetermined, unadjudicated. Is not only is it are you running a business, are you a financial institution? Right. And we didn't get to see the results of that, but. The argument on our side is obviously. And they should go after everybody that collects the CTR, gold as well. The right? CTRs and the SARs. Because if you, if, you, be, if you stack gold coins, it's the same thing as doing Bitcoin. So if I'm going to sell some gold to somebody, now all of a sudden I have some magic, I'm bound by some bullshit government regulation. Well, here, here's, right. another, here's another thing I thought about. So. Uh, I, I never considered it more any different from going on the Craigslist and selling a car. It's not. And uh, so what they were saying I needed to do as a car seller on Craigslist is to say to the person I'm selling the car, oh, are you going to use this car for anything illegal? Are you going to drink and drive? I can't sell you the car. Right. You might break the law if you speed. Yeah. I'm liable as the car salesman. Right. I mean, are you right. fucking kidding me? Right. So in the financial industry, though, it's uh, or financial regulations. That's that's the way it is. It's like yeah. if you believe, or if they tell you, obviously they say, "Oh, I'm going to go buy some heroin with this," you know. But there's no they, no one passed a law to to bind you as a citizen to any of these regulations. Right. As a city. These, as a these laws as apply a to banks right, right. under the Bank Secrecy Act. That's the only law that's binding here. Everything else is FinCEN regulations right. that are passed by bureaucrats. They can write down whatever the fuck they want. <laughs> well, uh, they wrote down some guidance to cryptocurrencies. No one's passed a law. This was guidance passed by bureaucrats. Right. And they're charging you with crimes. But it, 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 there's, there's some distinction to be made there between the whole. Uh, his case USD is very different than the That's like the money transmitting case where they're making illegal it. activity. The right. MSB registration yeah. with FinCEN is a whole separate issue from the US. Is it 1960? 1960? Yeah. Yeah. That's a separate issue. The MSB and FinCEN registration, that's a separate issue. Mm. Completely. It's not even the same. It's, it's 
to hold that. So uh, I, I was reading through those regulations one day, and uh, I don't know if you've ever seen 18007? That one I really like. So it's like, it basically says, if you hear about anybody that might, that's doing a crime, it is your duty to report it as immediate, uh, report it as soon as possible to the nearest authority. And that, they can charge anybody. I mean, you, you knew that somebody over there was maybe going to do something and you didn't report it. Anyway. Wow. Yeah, let's look at the 18, I think it's 18007, which is in the same thing. A lot of the Bank Secrecy Act stuff is basically boiled down to we want you to be our eyes and ears. Which is fine you when you, you are a bank. Right. Right? It's still not fine. <laughs> no, it is. It's fine when you are a bank. You've no, got not. this bank license. You have some yeah. duty yeah. to the government to, 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 to be their subsidiary. To, to handle their Federal Reserve notes that are their bullshit currency, they're playing their game, you have their licenses. Bitcoin is outside that world. There's no license required to open a Bitcoin wallet. Yeah. Well, that's what I believed until I was arrested. You're your own bank. <laughs> Alright, next question. Does anybody know if the gold dealers uh, fall under and do, do they register with FinCEN and do the whole MSB thing? Yeah, no. And have the CTR, SAR requirements? They, they, have, they do have some. They, 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 they have, have some. There's a subset of requirements that apply to yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Why would I expect that? Yeah. 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 If anything, it would make the most sense yeah. if they were going to apply anything to apply that. Looking <laughs> uh, back at this, what are some things that take out of it that you might do differently, like, for example, using, like, VPNs, encryption, or internet browsers, does that even make sense, or...? Well, okay, so remember I told you about the password thing, so if they believe that you have something they want, they can put you in jail indefinitely. So a lot of that stuff, unless you can stay completely off their radar, I don't know uh, I don't know. I thought about this some, but uh, I actually think I was kind of lucky that they got my Bitcoin. Because then they had them, and it kind of made a kind of warm, fuzzy feeling, you know, that they had gotten all my assets. And, and uh, if that hadn't happened, then I would have been facing uh, contempt of court charges and all that stuff. So, uh, I don't know, that's a really tough question. You know, there's a lot of stuff out there about. You know, keeping some of your stuff kind of available and hiding the rest. You, know, you have to kind of deal with that yourself. I, I don't have any advice for you about that. The helpful tool you want to look for for that are systems that allow for plausible deniability, which are will allow you, whether it's your Linux, you know, your computer, your password, whatever, uh, where a fake password that would work would open up something different. Right. Right. Uh, and not you can do that at your computer level or at your wallet level. And Bitcoin wall there are Bitcoin wallets that allow for that. You can put a dummy account and at that point I believe yeah, I believe you're I don't believe legally they can request you now give us the real password. Right. Well now do you mind telling us uh, how many devices are they seized for you? Uh, yeah, I don't want to say that, but uh, I had to give them uh, $40,000 of Bitcoins at the price that, at that time, which was around 165 Bitcoins or something like that. I had to just forfeit them. So that's a lot of money today. Uh, and they just took those 165, I followed them on the blockchain, they combined them with the uh, Silk Road seizure. Yeah. And sold and sold them all in a lot of two thousand bitcoins to somebody yeah. at, yeah. at, at uh, auction. There's another auction coming yeah. up for with six hundred bitcoin now. Yeah. That has uh, I think it has some of yours. It has uh, it has Thomas Costanzo's in it. It has Bitcoin Mavens in it. It has a lot of unnamed <laughs> just just civil forfeitures with no cases. Uh, more than half of them 
are just unnamed, no case claim, nothing. Just these are bitcoins that we've seized from various activities. Right. So without any like legal proceedings to go with it. Yeah. Well, we're basically is they you've donated it. it to them and we dropped the charges or said we're not gonna prosecute. Well they say uh, actually the federal system doesn't even have to bother with criminal charges. All they have to do is seize it and say Prove that you prove that these things are innocent of all wrongdoing. And by the way, you have to hire attorneys of like fifty thousand yeah, dollars minimum to do money. that. So if you have fifty thousand dollars to burn, you can try to prove your bitcoins are innocent. Otherwise, we'll just keep them. And that was, that's the end of the whole thing for most people. Yeah. All right. Any more questions? Oh yeah. It's only 8 o'clock. This is going too fast. Um, so one of the things we were able to use as kind of a publicity thing was they went through the house and they took every bit of cash they could find, right? Uh, they found, uh, I had a safe with uh, a little bit of cash in it, a little bit of gold of this sort that I had set aside for, you know, uh, security purposes. They took all that. But uh, they took my daughter's piggy bank and uh, her little savings that she had got from Christmas presents and all that stuff. And so uh, we were able to kind of advertise that on our website and get some sympathy a little bit for her. And the Bitcoin community came together and actually replaced that money, which was kind of fun. And uh, one of the, we have a picture of them presenting, a, uh, one of the guys presenting a check to my uh, daughter for that $600 that she lost. And that was kind of, it was kind of a cruel and it was a bad thing for them to do because it gave us a lot of sympathy on our on our uh, One thing I, uh, my wife is proudest of, is if you Google Michelle Corver, the, prosec the federal prosecutor in our case, number one is her LinkedIn, number two is my wife's website discussing her, and not too flattering terms. Uh, also, uh, Aaron McWhorter, who was the Homeland Security idiot, I mean, investigator that investigated me for 18 months, and after 18 months, did not know what I did for a living. He also, well, I'll talk about that in a second, but anyway, uh, number one, his LinkedIn, number two, my wife's website, where she gives the seven reasons he's the worst investigator in the world. So, so she's very proud of the fact that her website is following these people, you know, for the rest of their lives. So, um, so there is this rule that if you're an attorney and they seize all your records, they have to go through special, uh, special, their special stuff. They have to go through this uh, taint team. They have to bring in a taint team of lawyers that looks at the evidence and sees if it's pertinent to the case that they're doing, or if it's some other case that she's worked on and she had all of her legal records seized. Uh, and she told them she was an attorney. And this is a big hassle for them. So in the arrest day record, it says, uh, you know, whatever, arrested Bert Wagner, blah, blah, blah. His wife came by and told us that she no longer practiced. A flat out lie. Just so that they could get around the fact that they screwed up and did not have a team team on site. They claim they did not, after 18 months of investigation, they did not know what I did for a living, and they did not even know my wife was an attorney. Yeah. That's how good, that's, that's the level of investigation from Homeland Security. They're kind of a high level, you're not going to have a all heard all this stuff before. Anyone. <laughs> Anywhere in the justice system, just apologize to you? No. No. <laughs> no, they just took your money. Being yeah. government uh, means they're 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 your money. Thank you. Maybe not all <laughs> apology, but thank you. All, all through the process, somebody's taking your money the whole time. The attorneys that are helping you right. are taking your money. No, uh, from the Homeland Security Justice Department uh, and, and, and from the sh local sheriff, like I have, 
and one of my friends have approached the local sheriff to say, well, how much money did you get from this? And, and they just stonewalled us on that. So we don't know if the local sheriff actually got his cut of this or not. Um, so no, none of that. I mean, I, I did, the one thing I learned, uh, the, one, the, the one group of people I met that I totally appreciated were the prison guards. They were amazing. Like, so if you're in solitary confinement, you're, when you want to take a shower, you have to come in and you have to go through the handcuffing procedure and all that stuff, and then you're in shackles, and it's dangerous going downstairs with shackles and everything. And so they, they, they guide you down. You know, they, they actually care about me enough to not want me to wash my head in at least. And they were nice. They were really nice to me. So uh, that was the, the best group of people that I met was the, uh, the prison guards. And then the inmates were all nice to me too. <laughs> kind of took me under their wing. So, never had a nerd in here before, you know. <laughs> so uh, they were nice. And, uh, I don't know. This, uh, this one story this, this touched my heart. That in the federal prison, uh, stamps are gold because you get stamps, you can send out letters and stuff. And so stamps are very valuable. And when I was in there, um, the guy next to me offered me stamps. If I wanted to write. So that was uh, just as touching thing to have So I like the prisoners I met. People that are wrong in prison. Right. Yeah. It's like they know they belong there for right. the shit they get. Right. And, and they can sympathize with the fact that you don't belong. We'll yeah. talk a little bit about where you yeah. think. The, the laws and regulations are, are going a little forward looking based on your experience right. and all that. I, I was, and I don't know if you still live, you still live in Colorado, yeah. you still here. I was in Colorado a month ago and uh, there was actually this fantastic meeting we were there. Denver Town Hall, legislator meetup okay. okay. um, in Denver and they had uh, like a whole committee of people that were at least advising and like helping contribute to the state legislature on bills, right. clarity on the money transfer laws, they talked about that, right. some of the state congressmen were there, it was actually pretty progressive. Um, yeah, new governors apparently. Have been yeah, I heard that, the new California yeah. governor and Colorado go governor. We've got, some, we've got some some people that are at least... Yeah. I have a bunch to say about the political sure. system. So, uh, first of all, when this happened to us, my wife has always been politically active. Now she's, she's big into that. So, uh, she went to Paulus's office, and he was a state senator at that time. And uh, here's what happened, you know, whatever. And uh, we got thrown out of there twice. So we have no love for Paul. Even though he accepts bitcoins for, for donations for his, uh, you know, as long as you're giving him bitcoins, he's fine. And I'm pretty sure if I'd given him like a $10,000 donation, I would have gotten him to talk to him. But treatment? Yeah, I've gotten better treatment. But um, one of the one of the best things that came out of it was this change in law. Um, you know, we had we tried Colorado tried to get rid of uh, equitable sharing. So I don't know if you guys know what equitable like sharing is, but it's the if the federal government seizes property and the local sheriff and the local departments participate, they get an 80% cut of whatever gets taken, like as a kickback for their participation. That's the equitable sharing system. And that is kind of an end run around Colorado law. And so they had this, they wanted to pass this law to get rid of that, and they didn't. But we did get this reporting off, so that's there's that. The other thing that I think is happening is that state by state, uh, you know, New Mexico, Arizona, Colorado, they're getting cracking down. So Oklahoma, I think, is going to be a big, a big case. And I think if we get a critical mass of the state, then we have a chance to get some change in the federal law. Although, you know, the Supreme Court is going to have to kind of backpedal on what they've been saying for a long time. But maybe, maybe there's a chance there. 
get some federal action on this thing. I know that uh, Rand Paul is big into trying to get rid of civil forfeiture, and uh, he has sponsored bills at the federal level, but they've never gone very far. And, uh, it's just a lot of money. It's billions of dollars that the law enforcement gets through this. So it's tough to it's tough to wean them off it. I don't know if it's a true statistic or not, but I heard the forfeiture the total, but it was last year or recently when it was exceeded the amount of actual like theft that right. day. Right. Like true robbery theft that, that occurred. I heard that too. Yeah, yeah that's true. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 and so it's it it's 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 yeah. the government it's the government is the biggest thing. Like, yeah. yeah. It's it's a tough call because uh, because there's so much money involved and because it's going to you know, so many law enforcement all over the place and they're all kind of addicted to it. It's a, it's a, it's a, you have to wean them off of it. And, and another thing is there's complicity. The the, 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 the legislative branch branches likes this too because they're going to have to raise taxes to pay for it. You know, if we took all that away, they're going to have to get that money from somewhere else, raise taxes, which is very unpopular in order to pay all these law enforcement, uh, especially at like a county level. We're talking about if 70% of their sheriff's budget comes from this and they, they have to go then to their city and get it. It's a tough, it's a tough sell. Well, just like the year, um, I forget the name of it, but where they, they did your negotiation for uh, what was the name of it again? The non prosecution? The, yeah, the non prosecution. Now they kind of perverted its original intent and right. origins. This is, I, I understand the original asset forfeiture, the origins of that was for something where they, you know, morphed it into this and perverted it into their their use for today. That was meant for something original. Yeah, I have, I have a good story about that. I just remembered one. Um, so, yeah, the, the reason for this is like, let's say you have a drug lord that lives in Colombia. And he has some yachts or whatever, and you know you can't go to Colombia and get that guy. You can get his stuff, right? So yeah, that's kind of reasonable, I guess. But um, so in the first uh, uh, judiciary committee meeting, one of the guys said to the sheriff, uh, "Give me a give me an example of where civil forfeiture helped you, you know, and you, why you need it." And so he said, oh, I have this good case. So there was this guy, and he owned this strip club. And we knew there was lots of drugs and stuff going on at this strip club. So we, we could never get that guy. And, you know, uh, so we went and seized the strip club, closed it down, you know, and sold it and got the money and everything. And then he said, uh, so the guy on the state judiciary committee says, well, where was this guy? And he says, Fort Collins. It's like in Colorado. He wasn't even outside of Colorado. His thing was, we couldn't get this guy because we're in Aurora, and he was way up there, you know, uh, uh, 50 miles away, 50 miles away in a different county. We can't get him. Yeah, we couldn't get him. We have to seize his assets. It was just, it was hilarious. And that was his best example that he could come up with on the spot for why they need, needed it. That, that, that was kind of silly. All right. Thanks, Burr. We really appreciate you. Adam vs. The Man is made possible with support from SmartCash. Check out smartcash.cc to find out more about this powerful, business focused cryptocurrency that is fast, easy to use, and community centric. SmartCash is designed to be securely used for day to day transactions and put the currency back in cryptocurrency.